Now, I had a little problem with this book. Uh, the problem with the book was, was trying to talk about the whole baby boom all at once. It's huge, you know, and to address America's baby boom is to face big, broad problems. Uh, uh, like I said, we number more than 75 million. And we're, we are not only diverse, but we take a thorny pride in our every deviation from the norm, even though we're in therapy for it. We, we, we are all alike in that we each think we're unusual. You know? Now, fortunately, we are all alike in our, our approach to big, broad problems. We won't face them. There is a website for that a support group to join, a class to take, alternative medicine, regular exercise, a book that explains it all, a celebrity on TV who's been through the same thing, or we can eliminate gluten from our diet. History is full of generations that had too many problems. We are the first generation to have too many solutions, which is not a problem. Because you consider the people who have faced up squarely to the deepest and most perplexing conundrums of existence. Uh, I take Leo Tolstoy, for example. Uh, he tackled every one of these things. He tackled, Why are we here? What kind of life should we lead? The nature of evil, the character of love, the essence of identity, salvation, suffering, death. And what did it get him? Dead, for one thing, you know, and, and off his rocker for the last 30 years of his life. Plus, Tolstoy was saddled with a... a, a thousand-page novel about war and peace and everything else you can think of, which he couldn't even look up on Wikipedia because he hadn't written it yet. What a life. You know, if Leo Tolstoy, if he'd been a baby boomer, he could have entered a triathlon, you know, a baby boom innovation in the middle 1970s. Uh, you know, by the middle 1970s, we knew we couldn't, we couldn't run away from our problems. But if we added cycling and swimming, no. So... So the problems of talking about the baby boom, let us turn our big, broad, yet soon to be firmed up, thanks to the triathlon for seniors that we're planning to enter generational backsides. Um, however, a difficulty still remains. Uh, most groups of people who are, 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 are tagged by history as a, a generation can, it can be described in a kind of easy offhand way. Uh, they're folks kind of the same age, experiencing sort of the same things and sort of the same place. Like, it's like the cast of, of Seinfeld or, or Friends, you know? You know, I, I'm pretty sure, as a result of taking a modern literature class in college, that, uh, that Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott, and Zelda Fitzgerald, James Joyce, Gertrude Stein, Henry Miller, and Ezra Pound were roommates in, in a big apartment on the left bank in Paris in the 1920s. Uh, if that's not true, I give that idea for a sitcom free to any of the members of the audience here. Uh, but unlike most generations, um, the baby boom has an exact definition. Uh, we are the children who were born during a period after World War II when the long-term trend in fertility among American women was exceeded. And I had to that excess began promptly in 1946 when all the guys got home from the war, and it gradually tapered off until 1964 when American women were taking the pill or rolling over and pretending to be asleep or telling their husbands to go phone the Pope about where to buy rubbers. Um, 46 to 64, so it's, it's a long time. So the distinctions among different kinds of baby boomers need, need to be made. Um, now, geographical distinctions, that really doesn't work for a generation that, that moved around as much as we did. Uh, uh, class, uh, 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 distinctions according to, to class, to race, gender, sexual orientation would be offensive to baby boom sensitivities. And, and furthermore, they'd be pretty much beside the point in a book by me because as much as I want to be as different from everyone else as a member of the baby boom ought to be, uh, I happen to be uh, hopelessly ordinary in, in matters of race, class, gender identification, which section of Playboy I turned to first when I was 16. I'm, I'm just a regular guy. But time is a distinction that we all have to endure. So I, what I did in the book was I sorted the baby boom uh, uh, by age. Uh, the baby boom senior class, uh, they were born in the late 1940s, um, um, obviously of that ilk. Uh, uh, now, we seniors, we were, kind of, we were on the bow wave of the baby boom's voyage of exploration, but, but we were also closely tethered uh, to the wake of preceding generations. Uh, so in effect, what happened with the seniors is uh, senior, we were, we were keel-hauled. We were uh, dragged under the hull you know, by the baby boom experience, and we were left a bit soggy and shaken. 
Um, and if we wound up as financial advisors trying to wear tongue studs or as Trotskyites trying to organize Tea Party protests or both, you know, uh, we, we are to be forgiven. Uh, I guess if I can try to explain the senior class of the baby boom, it would be, uh, I, I, all I really have to say is that it includes both Hillary Clinton and Cheech of Cheech and Chong, you know? <laughs> Uh, now, the junior class, and I think, you know, this high school class is a very good way to, to, to explain a generation that refused to grow up. The, the, the junior class, they were born in the early 50s. They were often the younger siblings of the senior class, and they, they came of age when uh, basically the parents were just throwing in the towel. They were just throwing in the towel during the what's the matter with kids these days shouting match. They'd given up, you know. And so the juniors ended up pursuing the notions, the whims, and the fancies of the baby boom with a, with a greater intensity even than the, than, than, the, than the older baby boomers. For them, drugs were no longer experimental. Drugs were proven, you know I mean? John Belushi, John Belushi was a member of the junior class. And actually, John was born in 1949, but, but, but I, I knew John, and I, I'm sure he was held back a couple of years, so I think we can count him <laughs> in with it. The juniors were the teeny boppers. They were the groupies and the barefoot urchins of the Haight-Ashbury. Uh, now, they hunted up some shoes when they eventually made their way to Silicon Valley. Uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs are, are, are their part of, the, uh, of that junior class, born in 1955. But you notice they never did find their neckties. You know? so, um, now, the sophomores, the sophomores, they're the group that were born in the late 50s. And by the time they reached adolescence, the baby boom ethos had pretty much permeated society. Sophomores, uh, uh, they gladly accepted sex, drugs, rock and roll, and the deep philosophical underpinnings thereof. But they had seen enough of the baby boom in action to realize that what works in general terms doesn't always work when the bong sets fire to the beanbag chair. <laughs> Circumstances had changed. In college, many of the sophomores attended classes. Uh, some even snuck off and got MBAs. You know. See, uh, the, the preppy handbook was written by members of the baby boom sophomore class. Then there is the freshman class. Freshman class were born in the early 60s, and they, 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 were, they didn't get it, really. They felt no visceral effects from the events that formed the baby boom. You know, to freshmen, the Vietnam War was just something that was inexplicably always on television, like Ed McMahon, you know, I mean, who knew? Uh, feminism had gone from being a pressing social issue to a Bea Arthur TV comedy show that their parents liked, you know, and, uh, and Martin, Luther, uh, Martin Luther King it was a day off from work, you know. I mean, they just did none of these things really registered with them. To them, the baby boom world that we live in now is just a given. It was an ocean in which they were fish. And, and I think that um, the best example of that to me is uh, actually our current president. Now, you re may remember during his first run uh, uh, for, the, for the presidency that there was quite a kerfluffle about the minister at his church, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Um, was a man, uh, you may recall, Jeremiah Wright had a, was a man of forceful opinions. Forceful opinions, forcefully put. Goddamn America, and the CIA invented uh, HIV and all sorts of other things like that. Well, of course, Fox News and the Republican Party and political operatives took this and ran with it as absolute best they could. They were determined to make a huge scandal out of the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who had married the Obamas, who had christened their children. And, um, you know, after months of, of, of trying to turn this into a, a George Washington Bridge Chris Christie scandal, you know, but it basically came down to, yes, President Obama had been in church, but no, he hadn't been paying any attention to any of this. You know, it just right, gone right by him, you know. And I thought, boy, that's a freshman baby boomer for you because, you know, the, the senior class of the baby boomers, we would have been standing on the pews with a clenched fist going, you know, right on and suggesting property damage at the nearby uh, University of Chicago, you know. And the junior class of the baby boom, assuming they were awake early enough to go to church and assuming they could find where the church was, you know, would have been sitting there kind of nodding in stoned agreement and hoping that the church's social outreach program included a free lunch. And, uh, and, 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 the, and the sophomore class uh, 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 of the baby boom, uh, they, you know, they, they're a little more square. They would have been sitting there going, I, I don't know, Reverend Wright, I think that's pitching it a little high and inside, you know. But the freshmen, 
freshman class, President Obama, he's just in the back pew, you know, on his Blackberry with Rahm Emanuel, you know, just floating right by his head, you know, <laughs> he didn't even notice, you know, the whole world's full of crap, right, you know. And now, now the baby boom is the world's future. And everyone on this planet is going to turn into the American baby boom eventually, eventually, as soon as families get excessively prosperous and happy, excessively loving and permissive with their children, start feeling too much affection for their kids. Well, unless, of course, baby boom style extravagant freedom and scant responsibility and plenty of money and modicum of peace, unless that leads to such a high rate of carbon emissions that we all fry or drowned, or, or, or free. I can't remember. I can't keep up with the climate change people. You know, it was global warming there for a while, uh, and then it got cold. But now it's climate change. You may have, you may, may have noticed that. But at any rate, uh, it's going to kill us. Uh, <laughs> but, but you can't have everything. You know, can't have everything. And you can have a profusion of opportunity and at the same time a collapse of traditional social standards. And that is just what has happened in Western Europe and the wealthiest parts of Asia and Latin America. They're almost as useless as we American baby boomers are. And I mean useless in the best sense, you know, of, uh, with you know, abundant disposable income, ample leisure time to devote to pointless activities that don't harm anybody much except ourselves uh, and sometimes the trout. Uh, baby boom, baby boom like places, it's, it's interesting to me that baby boom like places they all seem to be having in that, that kind of same kind of national political deadlock that we have too, you know. And and, and a lot of the pundits all tut tut this, you know. And they they, they, they all you know political deadlock's a, 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 a terrible thing. But I'll tell you something: political deadlock is a big improvement over political unity, you know, a national lockstep on some bellicose purpose, you know. I mean, people forget Gulf of Tonkin resolution, you know, that passed the. Uh, that passed the, uh, the House of Representatives unanimously. Passed the House of Representatives unanimously, and passed the Senate with like one vote against it. You know? I mean, national unity, that's bombing Pearl Harbor is what happens. So give me deadlock any day of the week. 